Uh, kia ora. Thank you. Um, so let's sum up a year of global politics in 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> but also recover from COVID for two weeks and just have a COVID at a brain. So look, this will be a difficult uh, to follow <laughs> talk, but I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping that it works. Because um, there's a lot happening at the moment we need to get to grips with. Um, that isn't necessarily just uh, uh, the issues of uh, Israel-Palestine. So we'll start with economics. Um, it's the driver of capitalism, describes the situations we can expect in the coming year. Analyzing it, we can peruse the methods by which we could be most effective. Um, so this is a long-term picture of the G20 rate of profit. This comes from Michael Roberts um, from a couple of years ago. Um, people might notice that these are actually the um, slides from last year, my talk last year, and I will bring that up quite a bit uh, today as well. Um, throughout the world, the global economic perspective is dour. At a recent meeting of the IMF and World Bank in April, Kristalina Georgieva, the managing director of the IMF, outlined a dismal analysis of the rest of the decade. Ahead was a sluggish and disappointing decade. Without a course correction, we are heading for the tepid 20s. Her words. A persistent low growth scenario combined with high interest rates could put debt sustainability at risk, restricting the government's capacity to counter economic slowdowns and invest in social welfare and environmental initiatives. Moreover, expectations of weak growth could discourage investment in capital and technologies, possibly deepening the slowdown. All of this is exacerbated by strong headwinds from geoeconomic fragmentation and harmful unilateral trade and industrial policies. Now, IMF typically tries to write everything in a very positive light, mm. right? But even through that lens, you could see how dire their real prediction is. It's making it starkly clear that the capitalist mode of production is failing to deliver on increased productivity. It's failing to invest in training uh, for workers, or new machinery or plants, and is ever increasing the speed at which the gap between the wealthy and poor uh, gets bigger. So this follows on from uh, what Michael Roberts termed uh, the long depression. It shows no signs of abating. Business investment, the major driver of economic growth in capitalist economies, has collapsed since 2008. The IMF admits the investment growth by capitalist companies has slowed because they have not been getting the levels of profitability expected especially in the productive sector. The areas of the economy that are still profitable are the highly financialized fire economy, finance, insurance, and real estate. Over the last few years, to massive booms, uh, particularly in insurance, as we've been seeing from cost rises uh, just about everywhere, and real estate, right? Rentals, house prices, all of that. Uh, so much that anecdotally for us, our entire generation is priced out of ever having property. Um, we can still state unequivocally taking these uh, perspectives in that profitability is what drives the engine of capitalism and that the key explanation of Marxism uh, for capitalist crisis is the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Throughout its life, the system of capitalism suffers an economic crisis every seven to ten years, what mainstream economists would call the business cycle. These economic crises are not a, a blip or a mishap, but a necessary feature of capitalism. Marx described capitalists as a band of warring brothers. He said that they are locked in a continual battle to undercut each other to make commodities more cheaply than their rivals. In order to do so, these capitalists plow capital back into production. This leads to investment largely in machines, what Marx called dead labor. Uh, Marx divided investment and production into two categories, right? The raw materials, machines, and other goods to produce commodities that have an inflexible value. Uh, these are the constant capital invested by capitalists. It's called constant capital because the cost is constant. The boss is unable to control the costs of raw materials or machines. But the second investment is in labor. And it is here that a capitalist can be flexible as workers' wages can be driven down. The labour which a capitalist buys is therefore his variable capital. Again, called variable because the cost can be changed to a degree by the boss. Now, capitalists can increase output by investing in more of the same variable and constant capital, by employing more workers with more of the same machines, 
But a better alternative would be to make the factory more efficient by using new technology that reduces the time needed to produce the commodities. The constant competition between capitalists to uh, innovate in their production results in the accumulation of wealth and increasing inequality. Capitalism in this lens can be seen as a system of accumulation, as those successful businesses buy up their competitors or force them out of the market. And controlling variable capital, i.e. lowering wages, to make sure that the gap between the owners of capital and the sellers of labor grows ever larger. When you have a system of competing business units that are producing just to create and appropriate as much value as possible, you get an unplanned system of production. No one is watching how much they are producing as a whole. Uh, and each individual capitalist will make as much as they think they can profitably sell. And so a bizarre situation develops. As production increases, you get to a point where you have produced too much for you to be able to sell at a profit. When this occurs on a general level across society, it results in an economic crisis. Uh, we call this a crisis of overproduction. And it's this crisis uh, of plenty that typifies the business cycle of boom and bust. The next boom isn't restarted until either the cost of the variable capital, the wages of the workers, goes down due to unemployment, or the cost of the constant capital, the raw materials and machines, goes down by either picking them up cheap from failing competitors or because that capital is destroyed. These boom and bust cycles typify capitalism. And on a wider scale, this means as production lines become more complex, more mechanized, the less profit can be gotten out of them. And this overall tendency is what Marx called the law, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, that over time, the rate of profit generally across society will fall. And that's what that graph um, talks about as an estimation of the G20 rate of profit. When profit rates fall too low, capitalists don't want to invest. They want to hold on to their money because they're not going to get value, productive value out of it um, by putting it into um, factories or plants. Um, they shift it around. They go to more financialization, uh, financialized products in order to do that or um, uh, extend their monopoly developments or trade as share price, right? Um, and this tendency for the rate of profit to fall doesn't just explain intermittent crises. This tendency continues in between crises, meaning that the crises themselves develop and become larger and more protracted and the booms less of a recovery, particularly important point um, since we're talking about what has happened since 2008. It was a big, big crash, right? Didn't necessarily feel it at the time, but just about all of the big eight banks across the world nearly dissolved overnight, right? This is a huge deal. Um, and we haven't really had a recovery at all since then. Um, there are counteracting factors that a society, the capitalists can pull to reverse this trend temporarily. Um, you can call these counter tendencies, but over time, all profit rates will lower across the economy, as that graph also shows. Um, the bounds back are these counteracting the counter tendencies. The crisis in profit rate, the collapse of business investment, induces panic in the managers of capital. Many of the worst excesses of capitalism can be directly tied to trying to rescue that rate of profit. Deregulation of the economy, increasing unemployment, increasing privatization, the destruction of trade unions, all to decrease the cost of labor and rescue the rate of profit. But these policies cannot last forever, as eventually labor cannot be reduced beyond the cost that is needed to reproduce itself for long. New technological advancement can also be a counter tendency to this uh, fall in the rate of profit. But this doesn't happen very often, as eventually the new advancement quickly becomes another production line that requires investment, as everything else does, and the overall fall in the rate of profit continues. Uh, as I mentioned before, another way to counter this tendency is to invest in what Marx called fictitious capital. This is essentially stock markets, e-coins, uh, investment in property, or other ventures that don't have physical production of commodities. These speculative markets end up compensating for a falling rate of profit in actual productive parts of the economy 
but do not rescue the rate of profit in those productive areas. This method has been a huge factor in the last 20, 35 years, uh, as we've seen an explosion in these speculative markets dwarfing the real productive scale of the economy by an order of magnitude. And the last and most obvious counter tendency that we've seen in the last couple of years is imperialism. Either through war or more commonly through rentier policies and investment in global trade. It's not just boots on the ground that defines imperialism. Empire comes in many forms. And this includes, and it's not limited to, offshoring production and economic exclusion zones. International aid that must be spent on specific corporations, globalization and trade, access for multinational corporations, currency and bond purchasing, and the development of vast tax havens. Most uh, old colonial empires have moved into becoming these financial empires in order to stave off the periodic collapse and profit rates without having to resort to costly standing armies and occupations. Today, their continuing export of international profits, investing in other countries to take advantage of lower labor costs, are slowing down in themselves. Labor costs are rising in the third world and dropping in the West. The competition for resources and markets has been heating up and stoking geopolitical tensions. They're all struggling to find a way to recover that rate of profit. Over the past two years, we've seen the disastrous effects of a war in Europe a war that is largely deciding the access to markets and resources between the EU and Putin's Russia uh, over the Eastern Bloc countries that Russia used to control. Indeed, this war threatens to expand to those neighbouring countries. In the Middle East, the Israeli genocide of the Palestinian people threatens to expand into another regional war between the powers of Saudi Arabia, Iran, Israel and Turkey. Um, each of which have their own ruling class that are clinging to power uh, among crises. Further south uh, in Sudan, the counter-revolutionary forces that crushed the uprising have begun to fight each other for power, leaving the population scrambling, dealing with its own genocide. In Myanmar, the military junta threatens to drag its neighbours into an ongoing civil war to maintain its stranglehold on power. And then there is the ghost wars, the continuing threats and posturing around the invasion of Taiwan by China and the US and Australian uh, military's grandstanding around it. Throughout the Pacific, the great powers have competed for influence, the military bases, international aid. France has even reneged on its deal for independence for the Kanaki peoples of New Caledonia. Here too is the scramble for access to markets and resources. In response to the great crisis since the pandemic, standards of living in the West have decreased. Uh, at the moment, from the UN globally back to the 2016 levels. Increase in the costs of basic goods and shelter have dramatically skyrocketed as speculative investment in property and insurance have coincided with mass layoffs and the shutting down of social services. At the same time uh, as this, right-wing governments increasingly are in power in the, around the world have bailed out and socialised uh, taxes, funneling that cost towards the wealthy. Um, as stated in my uh, previous talk last year, I'm just going to try and change the slide. Hopefully that works. It's not going to. Uh, this slide which uh, I, I, I very much appreciate. It's a very complicated slide. Um, but uh, this also details that uh, even inflation as a generalized societal issue um, is a result of individual capitalists trying to offset the fall of profit rate, right? It's not because we've got too much money supply or bullshit monetary statements like that, right? Uh, it's driven by a complicated range of different factors, and like there are parts of the inflation system um, that you will see that is completely tied to the ecological limits of the planet, right? Like inflation will increase regardless because we are getting up to the boundaries of what's actually productively possible here in this planet. As you begin to run out of resources, the ecological pressure on capitalism grows, and you will see price rises coming in as a result of that happening. That's already happening. Uh, but that's not the whole story. 
The current trend of inflation from the last year that's still sticking around is to do with the relationship between money and value in the economy. In a Marxist sense, money and value are not the same thing. Money is a claim of value. Inflation is based upon how value is generated by profit making. In broad general terms, uh, money or slash credit is brought into the industrial circuit. Uh, here in the orange circle. Uh, and used to produce goods and services. The top cycle where it goes to the production of goods and services and then the sale, the price of production. The value expands inside the line of money and then that healthy capitalist accumulation comes back to here. This is the textbook definition of capitalism. Um, but their textbooks are full of people bartering cows for shoes. So, like, why would we, why would we ever listen to some of theirs? Um, the real cycle is what happens when production uh, isn't profitable, which, again, as the profit rate tanks, it's much more likely. Yes, you have injected into the financial sphere, right? Because actual productive um, uh, assets aren't profitable. So we're just going to have some uh, made up resources that we can then invest in and get someone else to buy. Um, if we do produce goods, the product is unsold or sold below the price of production, then theoretically we collapse. But over time, what has been happening is the attenuation of that collapse and the losses become socialized through refinancing debt, state support, or absorbing extra money, raising share price. All of those things that I've stated before um, uh, that happen. So these corporations are essentially socializing their losses, getting others to pay uh, the cost of the lost profit. Um, this allows those companies to have another cycle to put back into the industrial circuit, uh, and out of this, forcing others to pay the cost of their lack of profit that creates an increase in prices and leads to a sustained period of heightened inflation. It's important to recognize that the more you have captured the state, the easier that process is, and the more monopolistic the industry is, the easier that process is as well. Um, and it's in this sense that the rate of profit, I'm just going to go back to that other picture now, uh, is tied to all the brutish barbarity that capitalism has to offer. In Marx's words, capital comes dripping from head to toe from every pore with blood and dirt. The actions that have previously saved the capitalist economy from collapse also drive the accumulation of wealth and capital into the hands of very few. The precarity of our entire economic system hangs on a knife edge because the accumulation of wealth gets to such a point that it impedes the rate of profit. These recovery mechanisms I've described earlier only accelerate the concentration of capital in the hands of fewer people. As it accumulates in the hands of the wealthy, small crisis can topple others in a domino effect. Whole industries can disappear because of a single link in the chain going under, making us more precarious in the generation that understands the meaning of too big to fail. As I've tried to illustrate here, uh, the lack of failure of these companies and their continuation as zombie companies means that the usual recovery mechanisms of capitalism uh, to deal with the rate of profit have been usurped. Further acceleration of this cycle of accumulation, inflation, wealth disparity, the push for war and conflict. This is much more uh, of a time of twilight capitalism. The ruling class internationally has had no answers to the crushing weight of the contradictions of capitalism. Failure to provide uh, a hegemonic idea has resulted in multiple successes of the far right in different directions. Across Europe, a wave of far right leaders have taken power. In Argentina, Javier Millet has taken power, using it to radically attack workers' rights in the libertarian bloodbath. In India, Narendra Modi is likely to win elections again, leading the most likely fascist organization in the world, the RSS, uh, to continue their grip on power in the name of Hindutva. Even the liberal leaders of the sanctioned left in parliament or in Congress, uh, Joe Biden and Keir Starmer are atrocities in their own right and cannot even claim to be marginally center left in the traditional spectrum of politics, their backing of genocide. This 
lack of adapt adaptation from the ruling classes opens a window. Right-wing forces appeal to the masses using a saviour complex, a demand that some strong man will fix things for them. Left-wing demands are much more complex, requiring power to be taken by our own hands. We can see this ourselves. It has never been easier for someone to agree with the principles of socialism or rather the necessity of dismantling capitalism for survival. As the depredations of capitalism have grown, so too has its critics. Popular academics have sought to recreate their own more interesting interpretations of how modern capitalism functions, often throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Most have claimed that the structure of capitalism has changed fundamentally, its nature twisted from Marx's original analysis. Uh, examples of this are like uh, Shoshana Zuba, an American academic, titled her work The Age of Surveillance Capitalism stating that profit is now generated not through labour, but through surveillance and the selling of that data that created the giant tech monopolies. Similarly, Yanis Varoufakis' book Techno-Feudalism argues that capitalism has already died at the hands of these tech oligarchs, where they exist effectively as rentier feudal lords. Even more recently, Grace Blakely's Vulture Capitalism argues that the formation of large monopolies and their collusions with government have effectively ended capitalism's precipitous crashes. While all of these popular theories contain a kernel of the truth and that they are manifestations of maintaining the profit rate, with two of them being about the centralization of the internet to only the US and China, and the other being the capture of the state by large monopolies to keep them afloat, each of these alternate uh, perspectives dispenses with the Marxist concept of crisis in its clarity. That the contradictions within capitalism lead to its periodic collapse. That the tendency of the rate of profit to fall over time will lead to these crises becoming more and more serious. And this abandonment of a key tenet of Marxist economics can create worrying repeats of theoretical arguments that developed throughout the 60s and 70s from Stalinists to Maoist to communists, right? Old arguments we've already had, we don't need to have again. Um, the distractions that worryingly point to a different vision, one without the political necessity of dismantling capitalism. Zuboff finishes her book with an appeal to vote for candidates that will dismantle tech giants through antitrust measures. Varoufakis' conclusions are similar, as if a return to market principles will solve the issue. And despite all the mechanisms that the ruling class has utilised to recover the rate of profit, Capitalism hasn't changed its fundamental nature. It's entered its twilight phase. And this twilight phase uh, is an existential danger to us. As this predatory economic system may bring us all down with it. Climate shifts in the past year have been staggering. Carbon dioxide levels have risen faster than any other year recorded. This year, we're at 1.32 degrees above the 20th century average. The new heat domes, unheard of before two years ago, are now a regular occurrence on every continent. Pending dangers of the collapse of ocean currents, release of methane clathrates, and an ice free Arctic are very real spectres in the extremely near future. But while the left uh, has been more convincing, it isn't necessarily converting that into success. Throughout the 2010s, we could characterize this decade by its lost revolutions. Uh, book by Vincent Bevins, If We Burn, the book takes this as its launching point. Following similar movements around the world, where millions of people poured into the streets and squares to protest something, but often ended up having exactly the opposite of the intended effect. Starting with the movements the media dubbed the Arab Spring, Bevins focused on places where mass protests genuinely threatened or even toppled the government, including Egypt, Turkey, Chile, Hong Kong, Ukraine, um, also looking at smaller movements in stronger states that were never at risk of falling, like Occupy Movement, uh, countries that collapsed into civil war, like in Syria, and places where outside governments intervened, like in Libya. In each case, manages to find a handful of activists that helped launch the movement, track them through their unintended consequences, and all these activists land on the same idea to differing degrees that the anarcho-punk culture of leaderless protests hurt their causes more than helped them. When the movements got big enough 
to contest the existing power structures, they were left with no spokespeople, no platform, and no clear plan for taking power. The ending of this book is about all of these activists advocating for movements to explicitly become more Leninist. Uh, in the specific sense of having a hardcore ready to step into a power vacuum, to having a party. Groups are recognizing the issues that have prevented them from succeeding. There is a noticeable difference, particularly in our own political milieu on the campuses against horizontalism. But this has not reached the level of acceptance of the need for party building, for creating a professional organization that takes itself seriously, that can unite activists in many different campaigns and sectors of society to unify them and to set as its ultimate goal the disestablishment of capitalism and the creation of a survivable future for us all. We still suffer from the historic decimation of working class organizations. Unions still treat themselves as services rather than working class organs in their own right. Even our own small corner of the world, we the ISO now the longest lasting revolutionary organization in Aotearoa that's still active. And that's less of a boast and more of a lament of the revolutionary uh, groups here in Aotearoa. There can be no other issue more pressing for revolutionary groups both here and globally, and that is to get larger and more serious as twilight capitalism uh, falls. Thank you.